Hello, my name's Bont, Richard Bont, and this is Curmudgeonly Yours, a show on Society Bites Radio, part of the Radio Ear Network family, supplying social interaction for the mind and soul. The introductory and concluding music to this show is La Polonaise by Wieniawski, played by Max Bont. I am your host and curmudgeon, where everything is what it seems. Nothing is what it seems. And what is not said is often of most interest. Today on Comrade New York, I'll be narrating the final portion of The Second Promised Land, a supernatural religious novella, which I co-wrote with James Crew Allen. The Second Promised Land, or the Moses story of the Ten Commandments, is the second and last book in the series of the same name, The Second Promised Land, by Richard Bont and James Crew Allen. This is a tale you have never heard before, but it is true, at least true as far as I know. I have been dead for over 3,000 years. Thus begins the tale of the Ten Commandments when a nine-year-old boy in a New York public library finds an old book detailing a new discovery, that of the Ten Commandments tablet in the Baja California desert. Yes, rumors are flying that the tablet has been recently dug up in the pristine Baja Peninsula, and what with nuclear war threats in the first promised land of Israel the second promised land of Baha looks to be a better bet. The second promised land is the biblical pathfinder and backstory to the successful The Baha Redemption, also recently published in e-form and on paper on Amazon's Kindle. Do you know, listener, that the Ten Commandments tablet was never found in the desert of Zion, in the so-called promised land? Did it ever material materially exist aside from fiction? In our story, the tablet is found in another promised land, the Baja California desert or the second promised land. During my last two readings, Moses brought down the Ten Commandments tablet from Mount Sinai and found his followers, the children of Israel, worshiping a golden calf. Enraged, he threw his tablet at the calf and broke it. God chided him for this, but told him to go east, always east, crossing rivers and a great sea to find the promised land. Moses would need to assemble noble warriors to help him through his journey as he divided the children of Israel into two groups, one led by warriors Joshua and Caleb, carrying the repaired Ten Commandments tablet to the Ark of the Covenant in the land of Canaan, and the other with Moses, carrying a second Ten Commandments tablet to bury in the second promised land. After many months of traveling along what is modern day Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, through the seas south of India, through Indonesia and Malaysia, the children of Israel finally arrive in what is modern day Hawaii or Eastern Polynesia at the time. They think they are in the second promised land, but Moses still sees the cloud of God beckoning him all to go east, always east. As great as Eastern Polynesia is, Moses tells the children of Israel that they must persevere. And when they do, the land of milk and honey will be greater than they have ever known. Here is the final portion of the second promised land. The next day, they gathered their gear and prepared to set sail. During the previous several months, they had learned a great deal from the Eastern Polynesians about boat making and boat care and had done a lot of work, not only improving their own ark, but also building another one. They had contracted with some of the old timer Eastern Polynesians to take them east to this land with the rugged landscapes and barren deserts and promised them faithfully that they would become their trading partners for years to come if they did so. Moses was now co-captain of the Ark, and as they had done from Taiwan to eastern Polynesia, the children of Israel set sail for the true promised land. As they had found from Taiwan to eastern Polynesia, their biggest fear was running out of water, and thus they had packed the maximum amount of water they could in large animal skin vats on the decks of both arcs. Even so, their biggest fears came true when they ran out of water two moons time from Eastern Polynesia in the middle of the great sea. But Moses begged the cloud of God for mercy and prayed for a miracle. And that afternoon, water poured down from the heavens, 
completely filling their enormous vats with water. Then the weather lifted, the winds picked up and filled their sails as they finally, slowly crossed the last leg of the Pacific Ocean or Great Sea. They landed in what is now called Baja California, an 800 mile long sandbar with a Mediterranean climate, five times the size of Israel or Sinai, where the land sometimes narrowed to 40 miles or leagues in points. They were greeted by a wide, pristine beach of fine white sand overhung by eucalyptus and juniper trees and sparse vegetation. As the last trekkers strode onto the beach and looked up and around, they noticed that the cloud of God was directly above them and no longer far out to the east. They had noticed earlier that it had been moving closer to them as they approached the shore. Yes, they had finally arrived in the promised land. As they were about to discover, the sandbar they had come to was a gigantic peninsula and protected by water along three sides of its area and that it greatly resembled Sinai. And there were very few inhabitants. This land would become their land. The whole trip had taken 180 moons or 15 years and the young ones were now adults. Half an hour later, the boy looked up at the big clock and realizing it was now lunchtime, he was suddenly desperate for an enormous pastrami sandwich. Remember, the boy is reading in the public library. An hour later, the boy returned to the library, walked straight to the shelf and excitedly took the book to his now favorite spot near the window. He began reading. The children of Israel were so excited to have left the sea that they decided to give their new promised land a name in an official opening ceremony on the beach. The exhausted travelers found a piece of driftwood and scrawled out the name Bariel with a sharp stone they had found on the beach. The name itself had actually been decided by common accord months before as the native Polynesian traders who had accompanied them over had always spoken about a land called Baja, which the children had discovered to be down and east from where they were in Eastern Polynesia. Thus, Baja plus Israel had become Baria. As for the Lapita and Eastern Polynesians who had led them over in their double hulled canoes, they had stayed for a while, getting their sea craft back in order. They accumulated supplies and then set sail north where they hoped to find more trading partners. They bade goodbye to the children of Israel and set off north along the coast. They promised to return to Bariel within 24 moons time before heading back to Eastern Polynesia. Thus the children of Israel settled in Bariel and formed a healthy thriving community, not too far from where they had landed. At first they were able to fish and find water in the nearby mountains and in underground streams. But later they were able to cultivate the land and grow crops. Fruit was in abundance, especially on the fig, orange, and olive trees they found near the coast. There were no pharaohs to flee from, no aggressive tribes that wanted to run them off the land. From time to time, they would trade with nomadic Indians who would wander into their midst and who were basically peaceful people. After such a long and arduous voyage, this indeed had become their promised land, the land of milk and honey. As some of the elder children of Israel noted, it was no Eastern Polynesia, but it was theirs. After visiting their immediate area, they explored, they explored the entire promised land. At least Moses and some of them did, while the others tended to their agricultural chores. Moses hadn't forgotten what God had told him on Mount Sinai, that he wanted him to bury the decorner tablet and take a map back to to Sinai to show where he had concealed it. God had also told Moses that the land was at least six times the area, the area of Sinai and surrounded by water on three sides. They traveled south and kept the coast to the right of them. They noticed that the land was a peninsula and surrounded by water on the west, south and east, just as God had said it was. Naturally, when they got to the very northeast tip of Barrio, what today would be known as the Gulf of California and the Sea of Cortez, there wasn't any water to the right of them. 
At this point, they were to head left or due west along the northern part of the peninsula and desert. Moses realized that by going west, he would eventually get back to the Great Sea, Pacific Ocean, and his base camp. Moses was looking for a place to bury the decorner tablet. As to where that would be, he consulted with God every night. It was along the east to west trip through the northern desert that God told him to bury it in a spot that was about 80 miles south of the modern day city of Mexicali. Maybe God wanted to punish Moses and his new mistress Mary, or maybe there were not that many lambs left after their journey from Sinai. But God ordered Moses to slaughter and sacrifice Mary's little lamb, whose fleece was white as snow. Mary hid her eyes, but the others watched in horror as the great man bashed the little lamb's head in with a medium-sized rock. He did this with such force that a piece of the lamb's skull flew three feet away from its now lifeless body. Moses took that as a sign to bury the tablet there, along with a piece of skull and a killing stone. The rest of the lamb's body would be buried three feet away. A 10-year-old child witnessing the barbaric sacrifice sobbed uncontrollably. To console himself, the child began humming what is known today as the children's nursery rhyme, Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. Moses quickly sharpened his staff, dipped it in the lamb's blood and stuck it in the ground. Then a hole was dug, the, the tablet was placed in the hole, and the Lamb of God was buried next to the signpost, the stone, and the piece of skull. As Moses had been cap, uh, keeping a map of his travels on a piece of parchment, he made a cross on a carefully drawn map where this decorner tablet was buried. The idea was that in the future, any child of Israel or his or her descendants coming upon the burial site would be able to claim this area as their own. After, years of this, after two years of this serene existence, Moses, who was now 67, but in very good health, as he had always observed a strict Mediterranean diet, started to get cabin fever. In actual fact, he had been talking with God, who had made him feel guilty for the other 3,800 children of Israel that he had left behind 17 years ago. And God reminded him that his job was to find the promised land and return to his people. And he had found the promised land. So what was holding him from going back to Sinai? Initially, Moses was a little reluctant to return as he had formed strong bonds with his group, not to speak of Mary, who bore him a boy. But God informed him that as his messenger, Moses' identity was to serve his people, all of his people. Accordingly, when next the Polynesian traders passed by Bariel two years after they had said, Moses got on board with them and returned to Sinai via the same spots he had visited on the way down. The same geographical areas known today as Hawaii, Taiwan, southern China, Burma, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, always keeping to the Tropic of Cancer West, along the sea route in Iran to the tip of the Persian Gulf, up through Baghdad, and back to Sinai in Israel. Moses was 80, a very old man now, but still very healthy. 30 years had elapsed since Moses took 200 of the children of Israel from Sinai to the Promised Land in Baja, California. Joshua and Caleb, whom he had left with the other 3,800, were now 55, older than Moses had been when he first left to search for the Promised Land that they had named Bariel. When he finally returned, he was overjoyed to reunite with his twin sons, as well as with the rest of the children of Israel. Many had given him up for dead and wanted him to tell of his whole adventures and bring them up to speed about 